Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. With a tight illustrative hand in watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And here it is. It is Monday, October the 28th, 2019. This is Clyde J. Kell with the Artist Friends Podcast, Episode 19. I'm here with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hi, everyone. Hello, Constance. (laughs) Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. (laughs) All right. Constance is having a little bit of technical problems. We were a little bit later getting started than uh, normal folks. So she might be uh, in and out. All right. This week's recommended video was a complete surprise to me on uh, YouTube. You know, YouTube, um, because I watch a lot of uh, artist related type videos and I also watch Gary Vanacek, you know, motivational speeches. So YouTube, they, the recommendation engine is recommends, and that's how I find these things. I don't actually go and search for these things. They just kind of pop up as a recommendation. This video was one where, uh, Gary Vanacek was on a uh, podcast with sound like an Australian fella. And he was specifically addressing artists, artists concerns. And this was recorded back in uh, 2017. And I was so excited about that. So we're going to listen to a little bit of the of that recording. If I can uh, get the technical issues to get the computer to cooperate. And also, uh, I recommend a video of uh, from Seth Golden, or Go- and I think it's how you say his name. And uh, did uh, you and Diane, did you and Constance get a chance to watch either of these two videos? Yeah, I'd seen that one before too. <laughs> I like Seth Godin. He's he's funny. He's a he's a good speaker. An excellent speaker. I, what caught my attention, the reason why I recommended it, we watched it. You know, he said, uh, "Just make art. Keep making art. That's your job, artist." <laughs> it was very motivational. Yeah. Okay, let me. Uh, Every industry's top one, two, three, four, five percent are the people that are are making money and winning. What I would say is this: too many people that are artists. Um, really have an entitlement issue. And and what I mean by that is they don't want to do things for respect. They are romantic about the thought of like, well, why would you want me to do this? This takes up my time. I have done ungodly amounts of things. You know, it's scary for me to think about how much I've done for free, spec, hope, lugging in the hour. See, a salesman... Mm-hmm. A salesman realizes 80% of the stuff they do is for free, mm-hmm. hoping to get to that thing, you know? And so I, I would tell you that, you know, look look what's going on re- right here, right now, right? Obviously, I want to thank you for consuming my content, but here I am. You're a busy man. Getting, 
That's right. Yeah. I mean, and and you know, I you know, it's crazy. I get paid eighty, a hundred thousand dollars to give a speech. Sometimes I do one for free because I think it's worth the exposure. Mm-hmm. And when I was coming up and doing the things I did for a living, I would do them for free all the time. So I, my punchline would be this: recognize that there's always just a few that get paid the big bucks. And what your job is to do is to be smart about what you do for free to give you the best opportunity to be successful. Okay. Did you did you two hear that okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Any, uh, I, I paused it. Uh, any, uh, any thoughts or comments on that? I didn't catch what the question was initially, but um, I think artists in general are asked to do too many things for free. <laughs> Um, I don't think people value the work we do as much as they should, and so it's uh, it's a different business than what he than what Gary's in. So I think it's a little bit different as far as that goes. But I mean, I think you know, like this podcast and things like this is fine for free. But a lot of times it's you know people want their your paintings or your artwork for free, or to donate for some cause or whatever and that's fine if you want to do that once in a while but it seems like that's kind of done too, a little too much i think yeah. yeah yeah i used to get hit up quite a bit for <laughs> donations from my jewelry table and and uh for the heart association or this association or some other association wanting a piece of jewelry i mean i guess they think that if you pull off a piece of wire from your spool that it doesn't cost that much but if you spend you know eight to nine hours making a piece of jewelry and you've got a cabochon and you know a half an ounce of jewelry uh, of silver or copper tied up in it that's a day's work not to mention you know the materials involved you know so just to hand it over to somebody for free i can you know enough of it gets stolen off of the table <laughs> but there, there is uh there's two ways to look at this so uh on the one hand if a lot of people are organization especially organizations are hitting you up for uh you know donation donate your jewelry or donate your artwork you know for this auction or that for that cause that's an indication that uh your work is, is considered valuable. It's worth something that they they are thinking that maybe they uh, you know will be able to uh, obtain a you know an increase in their funds because uh, they have uh, a piece of your work to offer in an auction. And uh, so that's a good thing. The secondary thing is uh, it's like you know uh, Diane you know said uh, you can get hit up to too often where too many times you know you if you're not careful you can be taken advantage of and i like the recommendation that gary you know uh presented there he said uh you have to be uh, strategic you have to look at uh the opportunity is it an opportunity or is somebody taking advantage of you and i think if you go with that kind of a uh, mindset uh, many of these uh, moochers, in some cases, they won't be moochers. They may be real opportunities. You guys uh, have any thoughts about that? Am I am I way off or? Well, I think it depends on what the charity or whatever is that's hitting you up, and how if they're connected to what your um, reason for creating art is. Like I do a lot of nature, so. If I had like an environmental group or something that's kind of related to, you know, what I'm doing and I can tie my art to it. And if they're going to advertise that, that, you know, my art's going to be displayed and, and put on auction or whatever. And so I'm getting some benefit back as well. It's like, so it's a win-win for both of us, not just them. And I think that's part of the problem that usually it's just a win for them and it's not for the artist as far as, donating your artwork and that but was, i think like gary he does a lot of information that's a little bit different than artwork yeah, it is i mean yeah you know, we can that sense. yeah that's easier to donate than or to you know to give away for free than it is to do your artwork for free <laughs> okay so it's 
All right. Let's... No, there's pluses and minuses, you know, about yeah. anything. And Art that... supplies and, and jewelry supplies used to be inexpensive, but nowadays those supplies is one thing if it's something that you've got time involved in, but nowadays supplies for jewelry and art are exorbitant depending on the item that you are donating or they might be asking for. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's, uh, let's finish listening to some more of what he has to say here. Let me see. Awesome. Should an artist draw or paint what they want or should they cater more to a broader audience or other people's interests? I think there's a lot of variables here. Number one, you know, it, that's a very singular question, meaning every person that's listening right now has a different answer for yeah. themselves and they should go with that. Number two, you know, if you're ultra talented, the market will come to you, right? Mm -hmm. I, my whole career have done things that people don't believe in but I've been right and it's worked out for me and it's been very lucrative. Uh, I think you you probably know this better than I do. The, you know, the artists that are winning at the highest levels tend to be ones that create genres in themselves or are doing something totally different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, at the same token, if you've got student loans or, or if you, you know, want to put food on the table, you know, my answer is normally both, you know, I, I like practicality with aggressiveness. Um, and so my answer to that question is both. I would do stuff that pays the bills, but I would keep a good allocation of 50% of your time, 40%, 30% of your time where you're 20, where you're still doing stuff for yourself to keep those artistic juices flowing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. This next question, I think also ties in a little bit with what you said, uh, in regards to doing something different, but, um, one I get a lot is how do I get noticed as an artist in a sea of great content that's already out there? You know, my big thing on this, my big thing on this is to actually use the platforms I believe in. Like there was, you know, you look at Sean Doris, right? He makes a lot of money now. He was drawing filters on Snapchat before anybody was doing that. And so I think that one of the great ways to get noticed is to do things on new platforms that have a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how would you have gotten noticed? You did a Facebook fan page five years ago. You know, you did Instagram three years ago. You did Snapchat two years ago. Maybe now it's musically, maybe it's something else. But my number one rule is to buy a beachfront property before everybody else realizes it's special. So pay attention, artists, to all the platforms that are emerging and try to figure out how to, and again, musically. How does an artist work on musically? It's not as easy or as obvious as some of the, as let's say Instagram, but what you could do is you could make music little videos of showing you painting and then people will become curious of what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And then that's linking out to your Tumblr or your Pinterest or your blog or your Shopify or your eBay or however you're selling your product. So, you know, I, I would say the number one way to stand out is to over invest in platforms that are gaining exposure with people that are still not hit mainstream yet. Okay, let's pause it for a little bit and talk about these comments. Diane, what have you got to say I, about that? Um, a lot of the platforms, when they're new coming out, I think um, cater more to a younger demographic. And that's not necessarily the demographic that your art, uh, you know, at least mine doesn't. That's not who my demographic is, the younger people. So... It just depends on that part of it, I think. Well, I got a lot to add, add to that. It's, it's good. I, it I, is I, good I, to get I, on them to, for people to see you and to figure out if there's a way to be seen on those. Because if you are an early adopter on some of that stuff, you can really um, pull ahead of other people that aren't doing it. Constance, you want to add anything? No, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I know that we've, uh, you know, we follow Gary, Gary and I know that we've played other videos where he addresses that exact same issue. There, I recall vividly one of his videos, he was in a conference of uh, bankers and he was talking about, you know, TikTok and Snapchat and whatnot, you know, and he said, the demographics is, you know, they're 12 year olds, 14 year olds. And he said, you know, you're a banker, you're uh, you're alone. You want to make loans. Well, don't you think those 12 year old, 13 year old parents also might want loans? He said, you can reach your demographic through another demographic. If you create 
the, it's all about content. If you create content that is indirectly addressing the product or the market that, that you are wanting to reach, you have a better opportunity than so in the case of for artists, you know, uh, obviously, you know, 14 year old, 12 year olds, they're not going to be interested in what we create, you know, but if we create some kind of a uh, video or little jingle or something that addresses them that appear to appeal to them, and then they're they're more likely we'll sh we'll show and then at the end you know we put a little note in there you say hey if uh, you know if your if your parents like art make sure you tell them about us so we can create some more videos like this so we can create some more jingle or whatever what whatever the thing that we created that got their attention you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. he he's he's addressed this issue so many times in so many different videos you know and the catch the catch is the time it does take time and us and as artists i mean we oh god our time is so stretched it's 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 horrible isn't it <laughs> between you know just trying to cater and reach our 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 uh, regular artists our collectors just trying and trying to serve our current customers but this is what the internet marketing is all about this is you know and and uh so i am a firm believer in what the man has to say because i've i've seen it you know I've, I've seen it in action everything now the next thing what do you think about his advice concerning the you know raising prices or, or catering you know to the market you you agree to that i was i was really uh impressed the, with with his advice on that yeah i think he had a lot of good points in that part of it um because you have to bring some money in, like you have to make a living. <laughs> so to some extent, you want to do a little bit of, you know, what you know will sell and keep, you know, some other time for the things that you want to make that might not necessarily sell. But you do, like, I agree that you do need to do, be able to do that so that you can keep your creative juices going. Exactly. Because yeah. otherwise you stagnate. We talk, that's not good that before, I think in previous podcasts is, you know yeah not be a hundred percent focus on uh on catering to the market but keep take care of your soul take care of yourself too mm -hmm. and everything and i i was impressed with uh with his comments on that i thought okay he's been around artists he understands <laughs> you know what the creative process you know is about okay let's listen to some more what because he's got some like I only recorded about it was a well, the video was like twenty minutes long, but I only uh, took uh, six minute and three minute clips, you know, because of what I thought was the most important, you know, points. Another question that I get a lot is in regards to to some people call it creative block, some people call it complacency or procrastination, and sometimes it's an excuse, and sometimes it's a legitimate struggle that artists go through. So, yes. what, what do you think artists could do to rid themselves of that complacency or, or that creative block? And look, block? I, I, you know, I, I'm different than a lot of you guys, but I consider myself a business artist. I produce content at scale through my words, through interviews like this, and and I go into ruts too where I can't stop saying the same thing and it like disgusts me because I'm like, oh, that's boring. And like, you know, <laughs> you know, I think, I think it comes down to, um, and so by the way, that's why I started the Q and a show because mm -hmm. all the Q and A's allowed me to start talking about new things. Cause it wasn't coming from the top of my head. It was coming from the audience. Yep. And so I, what I would say is put yourself in a position to extract more creative things from you. Meaning I started a Q and a podcast to get people asking me business questions, which opened up my world. Maybe you need to move. Maybe mm. you need to travel. Maybe you need to break up with your boyfriend. Maybe I don't know what you need to do, but um, sometimes it takes the structure. The other thing is just perseverance. You just keep chipping away at it. You're going to have days, weeks, months, and even years uh, of creative issues. And, uh, and you've got to just realize it's a marathon, not a sprint. When should I ditch my nine to five and work on art and animation full time and make that my income? That's one I get quite a lot. When you can afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know what you're doing from 5.30 p.m. to 2 in the morning if you want to live your life on your terms. You know, everybody wants to be able to have all this amazingness. You know, there's nothing greater in the mm -hmm. world than to be able, you know, in the business world to be able to be on your terms. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you know, don't you think you have to put a crap load of work into that? So, yeah. you know, I would, I would say as soon as you can afford it, and by the way, most people can afford it very early on, you just have to live a very artist lifestyle. Yeah. It comes down to the balance of what you, how you wanna live your lifestyle versus how much money you're in taking. But the truth is you can do it very, very, very quickly if you're willing to live on a couch with seven other guys and gals in a studio apartment. I mean, it just comes down to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this weird image I think that people have in their head of being a working artist and just doing what I want when I want, but it, it's not really how it works. <laughs> I, I think, look, I think, no question, I see it in both angles. I have business people who like to think they're artists and they're just not. Mm -hmm. And there's artists that are just not business people. And what you have to do is you have to figure out your thing. I mean, I know some artists who brought on business partners and that's helped them. You mm -hmm. know, people that can actually sell their pieces a lot better than the artists can sell their pieces. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's a lot of ways to, to, to go at it. All right. Let me pause. Then we've got one more clip here. Uh, so, comments and thoughts about those uh this last uh, couple of minutes here. I agree with most of what he had to say. I mean, you yeah. have to work at it. You can't just, you know, sit in a corner and create your stuff and never get it out to let anybody see it. You have to work at getting it out there and, you know, so spend back, time. Oh, I'm, I want to be an artist, but then you don't, like he says, you saw my, my, you know, raising thumbs when he said, well, I'm interested in what you're doing between five in the afternoon and two in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how it is. You have to squeeze stuff in any time throughout the day that you can to get all the stuff done that you need to do. Yeah. And a lot of it's not home. painting or not right. creating your work. It's other stuff. You just can't come home after work and sit on the couch and watch television and then go to bed at night and then get up and go to work and expect that to happen. You have to give stuff up for it. <laughs> if you're one, and if you are wanting, if you've expressed the desire to leave your nine to five job and work as an artist full time, that's, that's it. That's what you, you have to go in your studio and shut the door <laughs> yeah, yeah. and stay there, you know, uh, after you get what you need to get done, done. Now the, the, the Seth Golden video, his talk was along those same lines, wasn't it? I mean, he was saying when he says, make art, it's your job, you know, as an artist. Yeah, you know, but you also have to look at it as a business. It's not just, you know, you're not just creating stuff all the time. You, it is a yeah. business. You have to do all the business stuff, too. <laughs> so it's yeah. not just going to happen by you sitting somewhere, you know, making a painting or whatever. It's not going to. Well, all that the, stuff is in my studio, so that's where I come in the morning and just do all of it, you know. Yeah, there, but uh, so uh, so true. So I mean, I was you saw me on my thumbs up when when he was uh, what he was saying there. Okay, let's listen to the last uh, about the last three minutes here. What he, and I, this is pretty uh, pretty good when he what he sums up. Should I sell my art and services for cheap to get more buyers or should I have a decent markup to get better sales potential? I think both, you, you ebb and flow. I always go a little bit lower in the beginning. You could always raise your prices. I mean, the truth is, if you're not just in a gallery, you can always drop your prices too. So I would say don't get into any rut one way or the other. If you're actively selling art right now, raise your prices. You know, mm -hmm. raise your prices. So just keep raising, supply, supply and demand. demand. Yep, that's it. That's it. Um, what do you think about Patreon and other crowdfunding platforms as far as paying artists? You know, I'm not sure what Patreon is. Um, it's uh, like a Kickstarter idea, but it's sort of a video to video sort of thing, usually aimed at YouTube audiences specifically. Is the question, what do I think about marketplaces that then drive down the is, cost of things? I don't know. Like, should artists be thinking about crowdfunding their art services or should they? Oh, like be, meaning like, hey, here's what I want to do. And then people pay. And then, listen, I yeah. think. You know, if you're talking Kickstarter, sure. I just think everybody needs to understand it's not that easy. Mm. You know, everybody thinks I'm going to put something on Kickstarter. Everybody's going to, you know, fundraise it for me. Or I'm going to put my art up and everybody's going to want me to do it. Yeah. The answer is sure. I mean, if you can pre-sell, pre-sell everything and anything, um, just please be aware that just being on these platforms doesn't mean you'll be successful. And what are the ways in which people think it's easy and it's not? Well, everybody just thinks that you go on, I mean, I've lived it with eBay and Kickstarter and, you know, and all these platforms. I mean, you know, even Uber drivers, like, oh, I'm just going to be an Uber. Like people just, <laughs> people want to believe 
that hard work is not part of the equation or hard work in something that you're not good at, right? Like, for example, you might be the hardest working artist, but you don't want to put in the hard work in business. I get that. I'm the hardest working businessman ever. I put in zero effort in school, and that's why I failed, you know, at it. And so um, I think people just assume the platform's going to take it care of it for me. The internet's going to do it for me. <laughs> these, are t- these are tools. Will a screwdriver help you with putting up a, a picture? Yes, but you have to do it. The tool is good, and that's what these products are. They're tools. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned um, school before, or just now, and that, that brings me to another question that, that's here. Essentially, a, a lot of people are asking, should I get a formal education to be a working artist? Should I have a degree to get into the game art industry or concept art? What are your thoughts on that? If you're an entrepreneurial artist, no. If you want to get a job in a company that needs for you to have that degree, yes. I mean, if you want to go work for Nintendo or, or you know, or like games, if that's what you require on their website, then guess what? You need that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you definitely don't need an entrepreneurial. What do you think? Yeah, about- I love his explanation. I love his explanation of the screwdriver and these things are tools. I it's love- so true. I mean, you can't just put, you know, your face on on the computer and expect, things to happen you're like in a sea of thousands and millions probably (laughs) absolutely (laughs) you're right (laughs) when he said that the screwdriver i was like oh that is such a good analogy you know it's just Mm -hmm. cool you know yeah they're all tools i I like his new term you know i I think i'm going to adopt his new term Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial artist you know i'm (laughs) an entrepreneurial artist (laughs) yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna change it to my art my my artist statement instead of saying representational I'm gonna say I'm an entrepreneur <laughs> because that that is so true but you know he said you have to you know because uh, I'm not uh, you know wanting to get a job working for some company somewhere as an artist no no way you know. <laughs> I'm too much of a libertarian for that. I'm sorry. You know, I just, I would get bored and burn out. You know, Constance, you got any, you want to add anything to this? Oh, well, I think that's a great analogy too. I mean, there's so many tools on the internet now, but you've got to work at it. I mean, work really hard at it. And that's part of this, you know, coming to the studio and shutting the door because my office is also in the studio. And that's what I do when I come to the studio and shut the door is I sit down at the desk and start working, you know, and it's, I watched one artist give a talk about what she did, does. She was from England and she said 80% of her work is not painting. It's working at the rest of it. And that's pretty much the size of it really. So you know, you want be. to be painting all the time. That's what everybody wants. But if you, and she is not even a one man person, but um, if you're a one person show, you're definitely spending a lot more time in office work and than you are in painting. It. And because that's what you have to do, you know use the tools that the uh, internet has in order to get yourself seen. Yep. Hopefully somebody, like he says, in the marathon is going to catch you finally and go, oh, way, look at this person. Look at what they're doing. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, and like your work. Like his, his other comments, you know, when, uh, you know, when they were questioned about artist block or whatever, and he says, you know, just persistence persistence just keep at it keep at it keep at it you know and how many times we've we've talked about this before in our past podcast you know our listeners are probably you know tired of hearing it the same old song <laughs> but it's so true isn't it diane i mean yeah i mean that's what you have to do it's like any spare moment you have to be um doing something to get to get stuff done because otherwise it doesn't nobody else is doing it for you especially if you're like Constance said, you're on, the only person doing it if you're on your own. Yep. It just doesn't happen. All right. Well, I think we've uh, we've beaten this dog down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> enough. And um, this week, you know, coming up here is uh, Halloween. And some people, you know, celebrate it. Some people don't. Uh, I happen to be one of the folks who uh, – I have always celebrated Halloween. It's always been a fun thing, fond memories of my childhood. And as an adult, 
Uh, no, I don't dress up in costumes and go to parties or go around and knock on doors, trick or treat, or play jokes any you know anymore. But uh, as an uh, as an adult, I uh, I really enjoy particularly the week of Halloween. I enjoy listening to uh, scary audio books and of course my old time radio shows, you know, scary shows and podcasts. And I also like watching uh, the horror movies and things and. You know, and so it's uh, that's how I celebrate Hall- uh, Halloween. Uh, what's uh, let's share some of our childhood memories. <laughs> you folks, you, yeah, I wish you, you could see the video, but she's got these lights on her head that say boo, <laughs> and they, they're blinking. And she turns the lights out in her studio, and all you can see are these lights on her head and see her glasses. <laughs> so, Constance, I'm going to leave it up to you. What is your fondest childhood memory of Halloween. What uh, do you want to share with our listeners? We used to have these uh, young men that we used to go over to their house and we would dress up as army army guys and we would burn corks and smear it all over our faces and take pillowcases and go raid the neighborhood of all the candy. <laughs> <laughs> so that is one of my fond neighbor, fond things of Halloween is going around with pillowcases collecting candy. I mean, so uh, and that was before the days when people were worried about razor blades and things like that. But yeah. we used to come home with the freaking <laughs> freaking bags of candies, <laughs> pillowcases full. But uh, yeah, so Diane, I feel what, bad for children today. What about you, Diane? Yeah, we used to do the same thing. Well, we lived in the neighborhood when I was a kid, and, and everybody was terribly, <laughs> terribly generous. <laughs> and um, mm-hmm. we'd go around and get all this candy. But my sister was allergic to chocolate when she was little, so all her any if she got any chocolate candy, it got divided between my brother and I. <laughs> so we were we were well sugared. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> A large portion of my uh, childhood, I think we was probably about 11 years old, and we moved into this small town. I mean, this small town, the population of it in, in Indiana only had about 600 people. That was the total population, you know, with several families. Now, this town was so small that we had one four-way stop, which was in the center of town. And during the Halloween night, we used the kids, the teenagers would do it. I mean, I saw it when I was young. And then when I got to be a teenager, I also participated. We used to call it stacking the streets. They would find any and everything junk in whatever. One year they put an outhouse in the middle of the four way, put a fence around it. And they had a goat inside the fence, <laughs> a live goat. <laughs> And other weeks would just be all kinds of junk and, and whatever they could find, you know, and it was called stacking the streets and they would do it in the middle of the, of the four way stop, you know, and that, was a, <laughs> that was a big, every year that was a big thing. And the local people, cause the, the kids, you know, they didn't get real vicious. I mean, I don't know about, you know, differently now, but at that time they, 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 it would appear on Halloween night, but then, you know, the next day, within a day or so, it would disappear. <laughs> they went back and they cleaned <laughs> it up afterwards. But it was always a thing that, you know, war- notices went out. You know, if you're driving and coming back from work, <laughs> you want to take a detour. You don't want to go through that four-way stop because it's going to be blocked. <laughs> <laughs> it was always there. They used to, the local newspaper, they would, you know, That's take funny. photographs of uh, – to see what new adventure you know with that year <laughs> so this is when i was growing up when i was 11 12 13 years old you know that was always a big deal and i always remember remembered that <laughs> stacking the streets <laughs> all right well i hope everybody for our listeners i want to wish all of our listeners a very uh, celebrate halloween a very happy halloween and if you want to hear some really spooky old time radio horror shows because i really turn up the heat play quite a bit of them uh just go to www.mpir-otr.com that's my uh, station website and there's listening links on there where you can uh, listen and um, tune in to some uh, scary spooky shows for the, for the halloween halloween uh, night and i have a uh, 
quite a few in, uh, lined up that I'll be playing. Thank you to everyone for listening. And this was for October the 28th, our episode 19 of the Artist Friends Podcast. And I was here with Diane and Constance. Bye-bye, Diane, and happy Halloween. Bye-bye, Constance. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> happy Halloween, everybody. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Brosnan and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Brosnan at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com If you'd like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com That's cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com this podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License 2019. Thank you for listening.